welcome to a brand new episode of T Watches a Scary Movie. My name is T, and of course, we're talking scary movies. I appreciate you tuning in for another brand new episode. We're trying something new here to where I'm going to take uh, certain movies and try to release these reviews separately for you so you can watch something a little bit shorter. Maybe you don't have 30 minutes out of your day to sit back and watch my show, or you don't, you can't take it in pieces either. So the easiest way is just to have that one review by itself. So we're going to do that for a few of these, make it a little bit easier for consumption for you. But... You can check these out on our YouTube page here at youtube.com slash C slash Theron Reynolds Scary Movie. Again, that's youtube.com slash C slash Theron Reynolds Scary Movie. So, what are we talking about today? We are talking about Scott Derrickson's new adaptation of the Joe Hill 2004 story, The Black Phone. Y'all have been seeing this uh, in production for a little while now at this point. Um, we did get a pretty massive delay back in September of 2021 because that's when the film, uh, uh, the film was originally supposed to come out. Uh, it was either beginning of this year or it was last fall and it got pushed heavily again COVID and everything went to make sure that the film was going to perform and it sucks because we saw last year that folks were definitely willing to still get to the theaters in the later half of the year and especially when it came to things like horror horror has done tremendously well over the last few years whether it's in the box office or it's on streaming it's just done phenomenally but who cares at this point the black phone has been released and let's break down what we have now like i said this is adapted from a 2004 short story written by joe hill called the black phone and we're going to focus more here on the movie obviously but the movie tells the tale here of a uh, young baseball player finn or finney who along with his little sister live in a uh, suburban Colorado town and currently everybody's frightened and they have a heightened sense of fear right now because kids have been getting abducted recently. A number of kids in Finn's local area have just gone missing without any kind of trace or to clues as to where they are or what's happened to them. Now, right off the gate, uh, this was such a pleasant surprise because guess who also lives in Colorado? This guy. And so seeing the, uh, the, the, the title cards pop up there uh, at the uh, pre-screening I got to see, you know, North Denver, I was like, oh my God, it's set in Colorado. And yeah, there's a million movies that are set in Colorado, so it's not like that's anything special, but there's something really cool about having a high profile horror movie with this uh th this filmmaking like cast together doing it. Like that's super fucking cool to have a movie set in Denver uh, uh, uh yeah, to this the, this caliber like that just that was so so cool to see that in theaters and i know like it was so fun listening to people in the audience as well too because when they saw it there's a lot of ha, 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 a lot of laughs a lot of chuckles a lot of ah so you know that's super cool to get that and i wonder if folks still feel that way for every movie that's set like in california or new york or like in florida because like a good chunk of movies are set in California, New York, or Florida. So, like, does that even matter to, like, people that live there anymore? Like, oh, hey, there's Times Square. It was just there last night. Like, I feel that anywhere else, you got to celebrate it when it's in your town. Uh, but I was also disappointed to find out at the end of the movie that it was shot in North Carolina. Uh, Scott Derrickson, I, I'm sure it's expensive as shit to film in Denver, but come on, man. I haven't recovered since where the Millers tried to convince me that that airport that they go, uh, that they go through uh, was DIA. It's not DIA. That is not what DIA looks like. We have one of the biggest airports in the country, and that made it look like it was a broom closet. Come the fuck on. But anyway, I digress. Shoot more in Denver. Uh, I would have loved to see more of our landmarks. But the film starts pretty poignantly uh, when after a baseball game that Finn's pitching at, uh, he unfortunately ends up losing the game for his team when the opposing player ends up hitting a home run. And... Uh, it's the it's the beginning of the film and we see that this ends up being the first kid at least in the movie that we're seeing that gets abducted by our villain by the grabber now we don't know that much about this character uh, who's played by Ethan Hawke again his name is the grabber there's no suspects there's no clues or anything right now but again as I mentioned Finn and his sister Gwen uh, played by Mason Thames and uh, Madeline McGraw 
uh, both the kids uh, are a little bit worrisome about walking around their small Colorado town because, again, kids are just getting taken and they're trying to live, uh, live very carefully. And it's hard to do that and watch out for things outside of your home. We have to worry about things in your home as well, too, because as we see, Finn and Gwen don't have the best home life either. They're, they have a very contentious relationship with their single father. It's implied that uh, their mother was lost to them, uh, kind of on the kind of more on the recent side now, and it wasn't a very easy loss for this family. And that uh, the father, Terrence, played by Jeremy Davies, who's just as good as always, um, that this has obviously taken a very very big toll on him, and he's in turn passed that along to his children. So. Finn and Gwen live in the horror of worrying that somebody might snatch them up on the streets, while at the same time, they're worried about the safety of their own home as well, too. And it's interesting because um, the film definitely sets it up and continues throughout the movie, showing us that Finn is not a confrontational kind of kid, that whenever adversity is kind of placed before him, he's good at bottling it up and just kind of dealing with it you know a character character lets him know uh lets him know later on in the film it's like you know you're good at taking a punch you're good at getting hit and getting back up and as much as uh, of a tra character trait that can be i think that's one thing that's really really good about uh, about films especially horror films centered around children is that um, a lot of times we just want to see you know are these like some strong kids are these kids who um, have a lot of great internal qualities because while they might be tormented by a monster or a killer or home life or bullies or whatever um, that they themselves know how to kind of self-regulate and I think that's important to show especially the, the uh, this day and age and I get the movie set back in the 70s but I think that's important for today's youth to see that uh, while it is always a great idea to ask for help whenever you need help at the same time um, there's alternative like there's alternatives out there that may not necessarily require uh, you know you doing all these different things and that a lot of times there are going to be kids out there who are bottling these things up and keeping so much inside and that you know like there are kids that can do that and that definitely works but there's outlets for that as well too as we see Finn's not necessarily the most popular kid around but he does have friends he does have a sister that loves him as well and that's very evident when Finn unfortunately is kidnapped by the grabber and the the tension that builds over this film and again we're avoiding spoilers for this y'all i'm not going to talk about anything that wasn't in the trailer itself but the tension that they build before finn grabs is is pretty pretty amazing because we do get to see multiple kids get grabbed including um somebody close to uh to finn and i think that's what really helps sell the peril of what finn is in because we're shown that this grabber is just, you know, it, it's kind of indiscriminate the, the way and reason for the victims that he's going and getting. But each time we know, we just know it's getting closer to Finn and his sister Gwen and which one of them is going to get grabbed. And we know again from the trailers that Finn's the one gets taken. But I do know that they try to set up and it, it's very convincing too that it might be Gwen that's the one that gets taken this time around. But Finn does get kidnapped and thus starts uh, kind of the bigger crux of the movie itself, which is Finn's interactions with this kidnapper, the grabber played by Ethan Hawke. And I love the fact that we're not really given much information about this character throughout the film in the least bit. We can take some implications from what we know from other horror films and the way that a lot of other characters' backstories have gone, you know, based on uh, the grabber's kind of delights and what he kind of revels in or seems to revel in because we don't actually get to see that much of it. This is very much a case of uh, leaving it to the imagination, which works so well. But it's there. there's kind of some implications that the grabber himself might not have had a great home life as a kid as well. And that kind of got seeped into every ounce of his being. And this led into him wanting to reenact a lot of that emotional pain physically onto his victims that, uh, you know, he was a naughty boy when he was younger and he was punished greatly for it, even if he didn't realize that he was being naughty. And so he's transferring all that pain to his victims. And that's a theory. That's a theory, by the way. Um, I, I very much like kind of put an idea in my in my mind from what I saw. And that's the way it kind of seems for the grabber's motivations is that um, that he went through 
a lot of the pain that these kids did and he's turning that back uh back around to them to kind of like exercise that pain it's basically his way of venting is to put that pain onto someone else and I think the mass, the ma the various masks the grabber has throughout the movie, um, it's also very, very telling of the character as well too. Is that sometimes he doesn't want like his, he doesn't want like his, his the top of his face to be shown. He doesn't want the bottom of his face to be shown. It's like different points throughout the film where he's wearing the different masks. I feel like it's a part of him that he's a uh, part of him at that time that he's hiding himself. That there's times where he's embarrassed. There's times where he knows he's going to convey convey fear and anger to Finn and his other victims. And I thought that was a very wise choice because in other other films, you know, where we have villains who are wearing masks, and I know we go back to slashers with that because that's really where it's popular. The whole idea is to keep it from you figuring out who it is. And that's not really what the black phone is about. It's trying to figure out, all right, well, who is Ethan Hawke's character? Who's it going to turn out to be? Is it this, this person that's in their life somehow? That's not really what's import, uh, the importance of it. The mask is used differently. And I think it's used to hide shame and hide fear and hide embarrassment and then to show some of those things sometimes and because of that that makes that mask that much more effective which in turn is helped by a great performance by ethan hawk as well too uh ethan hawk is an amazing actor and i know a lot of us have been watching him since gattaca in the late 80 uh, late 90s and everything um uh, but it's a very, very different role from him. Maybe not so much if you've been watching like Moon Knight recently, because like he's very much starting to get to play villains, which is super nice because he's a great actor. He's very, very, uh, a very, very uh, poignant actor that I love watching. And in this, you know, it, it's such a great case of what Scott Derrickson did. And I, you know, got to give credit to see Robert Cargill who helped, uh, who co-wrote the script with Scott Derrickson as well too, because there's moments in here with the grabber to where the fear is so much worse from seeing what's being planned than what actually happens. And there's some good jump scares in this film. There's some really good scares in it. But they very much took a minimalist approach with this film versus what a lot of other horror films do. And I haven't read the short story to know if we get to be if we get to see or get to get any kind of implication of what like what's happening to these all, all these various victims. So the one the one small spoiler I can give out is that there's a part to where Ethan Hawke's character, the Grabber, is just waiting. Basically, he's just waiting for a character to possi uh, to possibly trap a character uh, at at one point during the movie, and it's one of the most terrifying things in the film because you're just looking. And we know it's Ethan Hawke, it's just a man, and the way they present him, you could almost find to be hilarious, but. It comes off incredibly terrifying just from the demeanor and the breathing and the anticipation of what can come. And that's one of the best things about the film is that they really do set up the tension so high that when shit does start happening, it's such a welcome like uh, release at that point because we've been holding it in for so long. This also had one of the only moments that I've clapped at a movie theater in at least a decade at this point. Um, one of the only times I remember clapping in the last 10 years in the theater is when Captain America picked up Thor's hammer towards the end of Endgame. I had to clap. It was amazing. It was cool. We've been building for that for years. And I felt that this had a clapping moment in it. And I can't spoil what it was, but what I will say is that it has to do with, with a lot of the tension in the film. And throughout the movie, uh, a lot, a, a, a lot of the the lessons that are being taught to Finn and his sister Gwen, um, they have different meanings for both of these characters. And for Finn, it's a lot about finally coming out of this shell and finally standing up to, uh, as standing up for yourself because people can only stand up for you for so long. That doesn't get rid of the problem. Doesn't it doesn't get rid of your own problem you have within yourself. You got to do it for yourself at a certain point. And again, I'm, I'm not going to go in and spoil what that moment was, but there were moments in this to where I actually teared up a bit because I felt the like I felt the emotion going through it and just felt like I could I could feel myself in Finn's shoes a number of times throughout this film. And the really, really feel good moment towards the end of the movie, I had to clap and it was like cla clapping, but there was clapping in my theater and I was like, oh, my God. Like, this might be one of the only times in a horror film where I've heard and seen clapping uh, for a moment that was truly, truly well-deserved. So hats off to the entire crew involved with that. Um, 
The Black Phone is not a particularly bloody film. It is gory. There is some very, very disturbing uh, visuals in there, but it's not a particularly gory film. Um, and that's really good because the story really does sell it. The story really does carry it, uh, carry it the entire way through, honestly. And great performances, again, from Mason Thames and Madeline McGraw as Finn and Gwen, who just do an amazing, amazing job. Uh, Madeline McGraw especially, that girl is absolutely hilarious um and she can put so much emotion into every single action and every single word she says in the entire film she's worth the price of admission alone and yes if you're wondering does uh, J uh does james ransom who is uh, a scott derrick's in regular show up yes indeed he does show up but to say who he is would uh would give away the fun of seeing him on screen so you do get james ransom back into it overall I think this is going to end up being one of the bigger horror hits of the year. It's got a great team behind it. Again, Scott Derrickson, C. Robert Cargill, um, Joe Hill, and it, it's it's so good. Bloomhouse has another win on their hand here. You're definitely going to want to check this one out here in theaters. Folks, go and see The Black Phone. That's going to do it for me here tonight, folks. I hope you enjoyed my review of The Black Phone. Take a look at some of the other reviews I've done recently. I got separate videos here uh, for Alien 3. Then I got a couple episodes of mine, full episodes linked here as well, too. Like, subscribe, and share. My name is T. We've been talking scary movies. Stay scared.